Hello everyone, good afternoon. How's the energy like after lunch or are you still hungry or about to get lunch? <laughs> so yeah, this uh, today's talk is about uh, the journey on how we identified an issue on the VOLT implementation on of the iOS devices which impacted iOS device prior to 15.1 release and also impacting the uh, iPad OS as well as the watch OS since all of uh, these three have the telephony component in them, right? So voice, voice uh, sorry, voice over LTE enables the LTE network to support the voice uh, traffic over the data communication, okay? So quick introduction about us. Uh, I'm Hardik. Uh, I've been working in the security domain since over uh, 10 years now. And with me uh, here is uh, Rajneesh. He's uh, also part of the team and he, his prominent focus is around application and mobile security. So today's agenda, we are going to take a look at uh, what is voice over LTE, how the architecture looks like, how the user equipment interacts with the telecom infrastructure, how the connectivity uh, look like, get familiar with the terminology used in a telecom infrastructure. Also, we'll uh, try to elaborate further on various attacks which are possible using voice over LTE and which one did we, uh, which, and which one we are focusing on for this particular talk. We will also take you through our uh, test bed setup on reproducing this attack and trying to look for uh, a similar issue in different uh, devices or different operating systems like Android and other uh, uh, other device. Oops. Okay. And after that, we will showcase our uh, POC that we have and also talk more about the impact that this particular uh, vulnerability has on on uh, these devices and how it impacts the end user uh, as well. So that journey will be uh, taken up by Rajneesh to walk you through with iOS internals, how what has happened, how it has happened and why uh, this issue exists there. Then we would also show you highlight about our disclosure timeline because working with Apple's product security team, it takes a while for them to uh, come back to you with their response. So this entire disclosure timeline took about a year, a year and a half for them to fix the issue and then uh, allocate a CV for this particular uh, vulnerability. All right. So kicking it off, uh, some of the key abbreviations to note here, uh, which we would be using more frequently in this in this talk. Uh, the first one is the radio access network, which is uh, the base station where the uh, user equipments are connected to. Then uh, we'll talk. Uh, we'll we'll see EPC, which is evolve. Uh, packet core, which acts like a backbone for this infrastructure to authenticate for data traffic flow for mobility uh, of both voice and data. HSS is like a, a database, centralized database of all the subscriber information and which is used for authenticating authorization with on the network. right? and where all the subscriber related information is stored including what plan the subscriber has and uh, what where, where the subscriber is located. So all that information is part of uh, HSS, so it's like a, a centralized repository. 
MME is mobility management. So when the user equipment is authenticated on the network, MME is a node which is responsible for uh, ensuring that the connectivity or where the subscriber is and it updates the HSS accordingly. Serving gateway, which is uh, SGW, forwards the data traffic to the packet gateway, which then enables the user equipment to access the internet or other external network segments which are available based on the APN. So APN works as a DNS in a telecom environment, right? So uh, it has the name resolution service uh, which redirects to external networks. So on the phone you may see the APN configuration in your uh, in, in the network settings. So APN configuration usually would have two or three APNs listed in there. One would be for the internet, one would say IMS if the IMS uh, if the voice over LTE capability is there on the network and third one could be MMS or uh, yeah so it could be MMS. IMS is uh, the uh, IP multimedia subsystems that enables the delivery of uh, voice service over the data uh, packet and this is this is the prominent component that we will uh, see in detail which caters or which supports uh, voice over LTE functionality in an operator. Within IMS, there are several uh, call session control functions, which is CSCF. So you, here prominently we are looking at three control functions, uh, PCSCF, SCSCF, and ICSCF. We'll look into those when we uh, look at the voice over LTE architecture indeed. Okay, this is a high level, high level uh, architecture of a telecom infrastructure. Right, uh, and this particular issue is not limited to LTE only. It goes beyond. It also impacts users who are connected with a 5G non-standalone uh, architecture or non-standalone based network because the core still remains the same. The core utilized, which is still the LTE network, only the radio access part changes uh, here with the introduction to uh, G node B. In LTE you will have only E node B uh, in the uh, RAN, right. Authentication happens through MME which is then validated with HSS and the session is uh, established with the server gateway and IP addresses are allocated by the packet gateway, right. PCSCF, uh, sorry, PCRF is used for uh, policy and charging. So which subscriber will be charged for uh, X number of data or X number of voice, those provisions are done by uh, PCRF. But key thing to look here is packet gateway then extends that connection with IMS and another connection going through uh, to the towards the internet, right. So as we, as we uh, as I said, there are two APNs which are defined on the mobile configuration. One is for the internet, another one is for IMS. That really defines where the traffic would flow out of uh, the device. And so there are two IP addresses allocated for a device based on how it is routed out. So this is uh, this is uh, uh, to showcase how it is done, right? And what all core components that are being used, which is PCSCF, ICSCF, SCSCF. PCSCF, uh, you can consider this as a PBX uh, service, which is there in your enterprise network, right? Which connects with the devices, which takes care of authentication and everything. It's just that it, now that functionality is split between multiple nodes. So PCSCF still acts like a first, uh, uh, like a SIP server which takes in the request. Then that request is passed on to ICSCF which is interrogating 
control function and then interrogating control function will then validate whether that user is active or not what uh, what features are available for that user with the HSS once that goes through the serving gateway will come into picture and then it will have an active session. After that entire cycle is complete, a IP, IPsec tunnel is established between the user equipment and the IMS core uh, network and EPC is just like a backbone in this uh, particular uh, tunnel. So it just caters the traffic, it just handles the traffic, it does not have a role to play uh, then after once the IPsec tunnel is established. Key protocols uh, used in voice over LTE is uh, SIP, SDP, RTP and RTCP. Mo mostly when uh, telco operators when they do signaling protocol assessments they primarily look at SS7 diameter and GTP protocol and they miss out on SIP because SIP is again, uh, SIP has a broader exposure towards the end user since it is accessible to everyone on their phone, right? So you directly have connectivity to the core infrastructure from your device and that part is not really looked at that in depth, right? And two of these protocols, uh, especially SIP and SDP are signaling. RTP is used to handle the media traffic once the call is established, then that traffic is handed over to the media gateway for uh, the communication. So a high level call flow on uh, how the registration process works in uh, or LTE once the device is connected. So when you switch on the device after the connectivity is established with the LTE network, the IMS is uh, triggered. So there is a request, uh, registration request that goes to the PCSCF which is the first node in the IMS architecture. It PCSCF receives the request, forwards it to ICSCF. ICSCF will then check whether that user is active and uh, what all privileges or features that particular user has. It checks with the HSS. HSS will then come back saying that the user is present. It is active. It has so and so features, but it does not mean the authorization requirement to access this functionality, right? And to have that authorization, it will send a nonce to, uh, to the device and that nonce is then further gone to SCSCF which forwards it to PCSCF and then sent it to the user requirement, uh, the user equipment. The SIM card already has certain uh, secrets which are, which then are used to com compute with the nonce and the authorization request is then sent to the PCSCF which again goes through the entire uh, flow wherein uh, it gets authorized and the service is established and that is when you have a 200 OK on the device. So after that OK you have a uh, IPsec tunnel uh, between the user equipment and the IMS core infrastructure. What, uh, high level on issues that are found in, in uh, voice over LT. Firstly, it is uh, possible to enumerate all the services, all the components of IMS, EPC and the transmission nodes which are exposed on the network since uh, the since the concentration is more on SS7 diameter and GPT, it, there is possibility that you, you would have exposure from uh, SIP interfaces. Then you could send register invite packets to the node itself. So you're, you're still not targeting the end user, but you are only targeting the core infrastructure and identifying if you are able to locate other uh, components within the network. So by, by doing this, you can get the, the final domain of the ICSCF, uh, SCSCF 
the media gateway and then you can target the core infrastructure directly from that using that channel also you could uh, you could hijack a session or perform invite flooding or any type of flooding attack on the infrastructure that will exhaust the capability capacity of the core and that will enable other users to use that service right and then finally the last two are for uh, targeting the end uh, subscribers right wherein you could uh, you can enumerate all the devices which are connected on the voice over lte network you could send sip packets directly to those uh, equipment and you could interact with the basement of of uh, these uh, end devices right and one one of the things that so this is this is what we have done we've we've concentrated more on the end user devices and we've been able to interact with those devices directly through the telecom infrastructure and the flaw one of the flaw here is on the pcscf which does not validate how the traffic flows between the user equipment so ideally there is a segregation and all the tunnels are segregated with one another but we we've, we've not really seen that in practice although it is there in the uh, specifications and the guidelines which are released by 3gbp and gsma both high level of our uh, setup how how it looks like we so we identified an issue you, when on a production network but since we had to revalidate and reproduce that issue multiple times we had a setup done in our lab with uh, open 5 gs and camellio which camellio here acts like a sub server and simulates an ims uh, infrastructure for us and open 5 gs uh, helps us build the ran and the epc part we use uh, usrp to uh, to act like a base station in this case e node b we use test sim cards uh, it is i sim card card okay uh, then we have couple of iphone devices and android device so all the attack was performed using an android device since it gives us more control on what goes through and as we said so android device we can then uh, we can be set up uh, ip table rules or socket rules to uh, forward raw traffic on our uh, system and then send it to the network directly but here the focus is specifically on the ims apn which is there on the device and which limits the device to only send across traffic to the uh, ims directly and not towards the internet so the traffic flow is very specific in that uh, particular direction any questions so far i know i'm i'm going probably too fast yes a blade rf is uh, so we are using usrp and blade rf as sdrs to act like a e node b yes so we use blade rf for e node b usrp for g node b just to simulate that uh, the non stand alone uh, infrastructure and the lte infrastructure all right so we'll dive into the uh poc so here what is happening is we we've, we've hooked the device so we are looking at the traffic on the device and we we uh, we are sending a invite packet to the uh, iphone which is triggering that call on the device so this is because 
we we've uh, set the parameters of uh, mnc and mcc while configuring that particular uh, uh, our test bed so that is why you see the country name here but you could have any name based on the mnc and mcc configuration that you have in in your uh, test bed so yeah so that this particular attack reveals the identity of uh, the device that tells you what version of ios it is running it will also show you the mobile number of the particular user so going down to uh, the impact this is just a uh, one such impact that illustrates that we've been able to identify like millions of devices which are actively connected with the voice over lte infrastructure with their specific version details and their ip addresses so that you know you can have more targeted attacks on these particular devices but then how do you identify if that device what is the number on that device because based on the number you could also do further attacks like uh, location tracking and uh, other other stuff and location tracking can also be possible using sip uh, protocol just you need to craft the packets accordingly to get that information uh, core impacts are enumeration exposure of uh, pi information sending spoof calls performing dos activity on the user equipment and uh, network congestion so in enumeration we find that we have version details of all the devices which are connected on the network uh, pi information includes uh, the mobile number uh, of the subscriber also the imei number of the device which could further uh, go beyond imei and you could actually get the mz of that particular device and mz is a unique identification for that particular subscriber in the network right and then that mz can be utilized for performing further uh, signaling attacks targeting those uh, targeting that subscriber spoofing so we saw an example of how we could do uh, call spoofing so imagine like you know probably in uh, uh, in a country where there are like millions of uh, people staying and probably half of them are using iphone and they have voice over lte enabled all of their phones start ringing in yeah at middle of the night like you could send thousands of packets at once to all these devices and all of them are ringing simultaneously so you could create like a panic situation nationwide on what is happening how it is happening and so in in this particular scenario we limited ourselves to only signaling but if we implement the media uh, if we implement the media control as well then we could actually perform uh, end to end voice call with these uh, with these end users and they would not even realize if that call is coming from the genuine uh, user or not uh, genuine caller or not right dos what we have seen is when when this particular attack is uh, performed the device is using uh, this to exhaust the uh, the capacity to cater that function and so the the part the genuine party calling the user will not have uh, a link so that call will never go through or the user will not be able to make calls to anyone so this is impacting uh, the device and as you are sending millions of packets uh, on to the uh, network the other devices which are android devices or other uh, equipment will not be able to communicate using uh, voice over lte channel to extend to that uh, fuzzing is prominent wherein you perform sip fuzzing and you are directly fuzzing the uh, chipset or the library on the device which is helping this function to uh, to perform and now i hand over to rajneesh which will take you through what has happened how it has happened and why it has happened uh, so yeah rajneesh
thank you, Hardik, for uh, very well explaining the uh, signaling and the telecom part of it. So just imagine, you know, everyone's inside the room and suddenly everyone's iPhones just start ringing. Or in the middle of the night, you get a call and the call is from some certain emergency number, say 911. And, you know, they claim to be an authentic party, but they're not. So this is the impact of our vulnerability that we discovered. And this is what can happen in the large scale. So just to put into perspective, this is a design flaw in the VOLT implementation of iOS. So this has been existing on iOS since 2017, and we were lucky enough to find it. So it is impacting Apple Watch, iPad OS, and anything that has a VOLT component in ML. So going on to the next one. So on Intel, like exploring the internals and looking closely on the iOS device, what we identified was this, uh, there's a comm center library that is responsible for handling all the uh, communication part on the iOS. So let it be Wi-Fi or SIGA, like VOLT. So there's a lib, telephony, lib IP telephony component that is there on the I, iOS device that basically does all the things that Hardik just mentioned in the real time. So for example, when you are on the phone and you just switch it on and this is the library that gets active and is responsible to register you on the network. So there's a carrier grade NAT, so it's also called CG NAT that first assigns you an IP so that you can communicate with the IMS and proceed forward with the register flow. So, yeah. So once the device is switched on and uh, IP has been assigned, as Hardik mentioned before, there is a register packet that goes off from your device to the IMS core. So as uh, the entire flow was mentioned, so it goes through PCSCF, then ICSCF, and then the session is validated. Then there is a nonce that has been written back, and the <coughs> entire flow happens. So on an iPhone device, the SIP is basically handled on port number 5060. That is the standard SIP uh, port. And once uh, the iOS device is switched on, the PDP underscore IP1 is the interface that is responsible for uh, VOLTE registration. So it gets active, and the port number 5060 is basically attached to that interface and the registration flow initiates. So as you can see here, uh, it's uh, basically a register packet going out of an iPhone that has, uh, a base this is an unauthenticated register packet that has been sent. So this is the first step of the registration on the IMS. And this is what a packet header looks like. So it, try it tries to co uh, con uh, com communicate with its IMS and it forwards all the required details to the IMS so that it authenticates on the IMS network. So as uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that the entire flow requires an authenticated uh, nonce. So the, the first request that goes out was an unauthenticated request and the uh, PCSCF uh, rejects it saying that it is an unauthenticated request and you have to submit a nonce. So there is an unique identifier that is SSD or shared secret data that is there on your SIM and also in the home server and it is being validated and a session has been established. So according to the 3GPP and the GSMA guidelines, uh, what they say is that to complete an SIP registration flow, uh, you will have to initiate, like, you know, initiate it with the register packet and end it with an IPsec tunnel established between the user equipment and the IMS core. So once the registration has been completed, the user equipment should directly interact with the IMS core through an IPsec tunnel. This is what SIP 3GPP guidelines or GSMA guidelines say. But to a surprise, what we noticed was the port number 5060, that is the SIP port, was still exposed once the IPsec tunnel was established. So looking forward, we can still see the SIP uh, interface on the phone is still listening for incoming SIP traffic. So your phone is already re registered on the telecom network. You can receive calls, you can send calls through the IPsec uh, tunnel, but any 
body on the telecom network having the ability to directly interact with the device can basically create havoc. And this is what really happened in this case. So the 3GPP guidelines say that once the IPsec tunnel is established, you are supposed to you know, terminate that socket connection so that none of the other you know, interfaces are being left active and all the communication is taken through to through the IPsec tunnel. So similar observation was also, you know, because we were interested in uh, a scenario uh, that if it is happening in iOS, is it happening in Android and other devices as well? So when we look closely on Android, we found out that, you know, Android has implemented it properly. So it was a few of the Samsung devices and also Pixel devices that we know, like interrogated. And we identified that once the IPsec tunnel has been established end to end from the user equipment to IMS core, the, call, the connection manager on Android terminates the socket connection to 5060 and it doesn't listen to any incoming traffic. So how did this discovery go through? This is a very interesting part actually. So here on the left, uh, right side you can see, uh, left side actually, yeah, left side you can see a list of all the iOS devices on the network. And on the right side, it's a basic good old friend of ours, I would say, Nmap. So we sweep the entire uh, network or the IP range for all the active devices on a network. And to a surprise, what we found was all the devices that responded back to us were only iOS devices. And the devices were a few million, just to put into numbers. So basically, you could enumerate all the devices that are there in that given network. So we had a list of all the iOS devices that are basically present with their iOS versions, with the phone numbers, and more specific details. So to confirm that we can directly interact with those services, because Nmap was able to discover those, we crafted a SIP packet from our end, and we tried you know, connecting with that discovered IPs or the discovered devices. So sending on the SIP packet, the device basically responded to the incoming SIP traffic, even though it was establishing an end-to-end -end connection with the IMS, but it still responded to our incoming traffic and the target started ringing, as you saw in the video earlier. And this is a basic trace that also shows or demonstrates the similar uh, observation that we had. So there is an invite packet that went through the session is in progress and the target was ringing. So this basically proves that, you know, even though the connection is established on uh, the IPsec tunnel, that is the lower box that you can see, the device still listens on the port number 55060. So any incoming communication, any malformed SIP traffic or any maliciously, maliciously crafted SIP packet can directly interact with the device and basically, you know, have the impacts. So just to cover the entire story, you know, we, we did not do a deep dive into what exactly this was. And this is basically, you know, putting attention to details. Because such thing, uh, something as minute as an implementation flaw or something that is basically, you know, specified in the guidelines and not being implemented properly can lead to a very escalated impact. So as you can see in the small uh, demo, like the screenshot on the right, the attacker is basically able to directly communicate with the victim device using the telecom infrastructure as its backbone without registering any of its ongoing traffic. So there is no billing happening. There is no basically tracking or logging happening on the telecom core and the attack is basically directly able to interact with the user equipment, that is the target, and perform targeted attacks. So as Hardik mentioned before, we were able to get in the, uh, certain details of the subscriber uh, or the target victim, and it, it included IMEA number, MSS, MS, ISDN of the device, uh, specific iOS versions, which could help us, you know, craft more specific attacks and yeah, escalate it further. So uh, attaching an RTP packet on the SIP 
back, backend basically can allow us to even include a spoof. And this is what I mentioned that if some, you get a call from somebody saying that they're police, but they're not police. They're somebody else. So this is what this attack can basically, you know, have an outcome of. So how was this issue mitigated? This was very easy. Nothing as a rocket science. This, they just had to, you know, go through the GSMA guidelines or the 3GBP guidelines and look very closely into it and how it has to be implemented. So once the GSMA guidelines were properly, you know, verified by Apple, they understood that they have to terminate the socket connection to port 5060 so that no incoming SIP traffic can interact with the com center library or lib IP telephony component and basically it won't react to any incoming traffic sent to it. And it only accepts connection that is over the IPsec tunnel. And the trust has already been established between the UE and the IPsec tunnel, uh, IMS, through the IPsec tunnel. So there is no malicious traffic coming in on that library. So this was pretty simple, I would say. But it still took Apple almost a year to, you know, from the date of submission to the end date wherein a CV was assigned. The CV was assigned in 2022, but it was 2021 for some reason. And yeah, this was the entire disclosure timeline that we went through. So we initially reported to Apple in March 2021, and there was a fix implemented, which was bypassed by us. And then there was another fix that came out in uh, iOS 15.2, uh, which basically, you know, uh, resolved the issue and the demonstrated issue has been fixed. So this was all. And yeah, thank you guys so much for listening through. So a key takeaway from this is you do not have to be a rocket scientist to, you know, find critical vulnerabilities in any uh, given component or a device or a target. There are simpler things that always go missed by people. See, for example, this issue had been there for like four or five years now since the implementation of VOLT, but has been discovered by us in 2021. So uh, I would recommend, so uh, in further, we've already, already started because we were able to still interact with those components. Uh, we have uh, started fuzzing the SIP component for more fun and profit. So let's keep you guys posted and Hope to return back on the next version of HITV. Thank you. Thank you.